evening, folks. And welcome to another Irish Whiskey Society tasting. In case you aren't aware, this is also a hybrid event. So I'm going to say hello to the folks. I can hear my echo in the room, so I know the sound is coming through, so I don't need to do a check. And a big welcome to the folks who are online. If you're able to maybe pop into the chat as well, say hello to them. Treat it like it is an online tasting. Treat it like it is an in-person tasting. It's a hybrid tasting. Keep everyone involved. For the folks at home, let us know where you're dialing in from because this is something we want to do more and more of to have these hybrid tastings. We know a lot of our members are outside Dublin or can't travel up all the time for the events. So just let us know where you're coming from so we have you know, proof that these are good ideas and we, it's good and we can get our members involved and just let us know what you think of the whiskies throughout the tasting. Now, first off, going to address a little bit of an elephant in the room. Well, it's not an elephant in the room. It's an elephant at home in the tasting packs. The folks here are fine. Unfortunately, some of the samples that were sent out in the tasting packs were... I wouldn't say contaminated because it's not poisonous, but they were maybe tainted with a little bit of mint. The company we use uh, to bottle the bottles, they make bitters, it's off the cuff bitters. Great company, but unfortunately a small amount of peppermint oil was left in kind of the decanting system when they were putting the whiskey from the bottles into the mini bottles. And of course it had to be peppermint. If it was orange oil, if it was old fashioned bitters, kind of those flavors, probably wouldn't have been as noticeable, but from what we've heard, the 40 or so bottles that have been affected by this um, kind of have a feeling like they went through a Listerine cask. And it's not, <laughs> like a Listerine cask, it might be different, but different doesn't always mean good. So we are gonna work to make that right. Uh, some of you have already received spare packs. We're gonna fix it up for everyone and make sure everyone's fine. But it was the two samples of the Hedonism and the Loch Re were the ones that were unfortunately kind of tainted. And so we'll make it up to you guys as best as we can, but at least the rest of the whiskies are going to be fine. I'd like to give a quick shout out to Alex on the events team, not here today. He's unfortunately not able to attend tonight, but he did a lot of the running on the, getting the whiskies for tonight. You'll see that there are samples that are in mysterious bottles because they have not yet been released or maybe will never be released. You'll see there are samples that are 45 years old, did a lot of work getting this event off the ground and kind of up and running. So just going to give a big shout out to him, big thanks to him. Folks in the chat, give him big thanks. He will be watching it. And folks in the room, thank you, Alex. Yay. He did order three of these sample packs to make sure he would have enough of the tasting to go around. <laughs> Sorry. It's horizontal. It's horizontal. Okay. Um, I'll look to fix that in just okay. a moment. Oh, it's very... Can you? Oh, it's sideways. Okay, I'll see if I can fix that when I'm sitting back down in a moment. Until then, folks, don't crane your head sideways. Just, you know, just listen to the dulcet tones coming through. Leave it, Brian, and be around. I'll be around. I'll take care of it. Um, keep going, keep going. Brian is trying to fix it up for you, folks. Hopefully everything works out fine. Anyway, in the meantime, those of us in the room and those of us at home have what we have here, a mystery sample spotlight or a spotlight sample. This is something we're trying to do for you folks. Some of the people in the room are looking at the bottles here. Some people have already poured it out and drunk it. <laughs> looking at one person in particular who asked for a special glass just to have it. Uh, this is something we're trying to do where we get kind of new, unreleased, yet to be released, maybe mystery whiskies that will never be released for you guys so you can taste them and you can kind of maybe give a bit of feedback to the distilleries. Sometimes there'll be whiskies that are not yet released so that you know, the distillery might look at it and say, oh, maybe it needs a few extra months, maybe it needs maybe a little bit higher ABV, a little lower ABV, that sort of thing. So just to kind of get it out. This right here in front of you is the Curramore Single Pot Still, their inaugural release. It was just released, I think, end of last month-ish, September-ish, I think, or was it, no, sorry, October, uh, August? Anyway, it's a brand new whiskey. It comes from Curramore. This is made by GND, but not made by GND stock. So it is whiskey made with barley and unmalted, uh, pot still whiskey, sorry, made with barley, unmalted barley and oats from the Curramore estate. So it's their own stuff that they contracted GND to make for them. So it is made by GND, but it's not actually, you know, sourced whiskey in the, the traditional sourced whiskey sense of the word. 47.5% malt, 47.5% unmalted and 5% oats again, all from the estate comes from three different casks, Oloroso Sherry, Virgin French Oak, and Bourbon. Their plan is to release single casks of those whiskies next year, so it's January to June, single casks of the individual components that have gone into this kind of triple cask blend. 46% for those of you who 
want to know that kind of information. And if there's any questions, pop them in the chat. Share them out now. Otherwise, I'll pass it over to Kevin for the start of our mainline samples, which are Scotch whiskies. No questions? Great stuff. So. Over to Kevin. Good evening, everybody. Uh, we're going to start with Compass Box at the bottom left, then move on to Girvan, and I'll finish off on Invergordon before taking the break. I think John Glazer uh, with Compass Box was revolutionary in the sense that Single grain wasn't really thought of much until hedonism. Now, hedonism first came out in 2000, and it, it, it was a, a blended grain, but it just showed what aged single grain in great casks, first fill bourbon casks, can do. And the name gives it away, hedonism. It is this wonderful, uh, indulgent liquid. That was back in 2000. In 2012, there's a luxury wine store in Mayfair called Hedonism Wines. And before they uh, opened, they asked permission from Hedonism if they could use the name. Hedonism said uh, yes. And they also uh, collaborated with them to produce this blended uh, grain. Hedonism 2, it's only available, it's an exclusive to Hedonism Wines. And the great thing about uh, Compass Box is they tell you exactly uh, what, it, what is in the liquid. So it's made up of uh, North British single grain, 51% in recharred barrels, 22% uh, uh, single grain from Girvan in first fill bourbon, and 26% single grain, first fill bourbon again, from the Port Dundas distillery, which is now a closed distillery. That closed in 1993. So let's um, raise a glass, nose it, and see what you think. I, wa I won't give their, their tasting notes, but just what they say. This is not a whiskey to drink standing up or perched on a bar stool. Once poured into a glass, find somewhere comfortable to recline and savour. Does that mean you can't drink it? <laughs> <laughs> what are first impressions? Fruity. 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 Yeah. Lemon curd. So what have we got? No comments yet. So people uh, from the comfort of your home, do give us your, uh, your comments. I'm getting a bit of lemon curd on the nose and kind of Yep, pear, but I was, was going to say a, sort of a, a white pepper note on the nose. Like vanilla ice cream. Kind of yeah, that first fill bourbon giving that butterscotch toffee note. What's the age on this? Here? Sorry, the age on this is 23 years and the ABV is 49%. So 23 refers to the, obviously to, to, the, to the 
uh, youngest whiskey in there. I mean, for 49%, it's, it's got that bit of peppery heat, but also it's got a, you know, you, you wouldn't think it's 49%. I wouldn't think it's 49%. It's got a lovely, creamy finish. So. Any, any, what, what, any other people think I had sort of somebody say sort of there's a, you got a leathery, earthy finish? Yeah, quite oaky. No. What do people think? I mean, do, do people are sort of nosing it and savouring it. Is it something you like? Yeah, definitely. That's okay, that's good. <laughs> yeah. I think it's very, very, very easy to drink. You don't have to think too much about it. Someone's uh, tasting some sort of minty notes off this one. <laughs> 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 so, yeah, you're lying, you're lying. We know you're lying. <laughs> Okay, so this is um, only available, as I said, at Hedonism Wines. There, there was only 648 bottles of this made. Yeah. Well, for, for this for this particular batch, yeah. <laughs> Uh, price, good question. I think it was something like 150, something like that. Yeah, I'm getting a few, few orange notes over there. Fruity, fruity and sweet. Okay. And any more? If, if there's no more comments, I'll, I'll move on to uh, the next one. Like? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so so. Yeah. And no. Okay, sort of, kind of, yeah, few, few didn't like, but majority like. Moving on to the second sample is Gervin uh, 26, made by uh, Red Cask, so an in independent bottler. This is sourced from Master of Malts, 26 year old. And one of the things sort of a theme tonight, certainly on old Scotch grain, is the value for money when you compare to single malts of a similar age. This was uh, 145 euro. The Girvan distillery was uh, set up in 1963. The first spirit flowed off the still in Christmas Day 1963. That was a coffee still. But this uh, has been made from a second type of still they introduced in 1992 and they got a patent for it for it was a, um, a, a vacuum multi-pressure vacuum distillation instead of uh, and what that means is that alcohol boils at a lower temperature so instead of 78 degrees it's 74 degrees and that gives a, a, a very clean zesty sort of elegant type of spirit that goes really well with um, first wheel bourbon in particular but also sherry cask. 
the best way I can remember that the technical director explained it to me at Girvan is if you get a fried egg and you, and you put the heat too high, you, you get sort of burnt, crispy around the edges. That's the proteins burning in the egg. So when you lower the temperature, you don't get those, those sort of burnt protein notes, which, which blenders you know, are, are, are really keen to avoid those. So this was um, produced, the spirit produced on that still in uh, 1996. We don't know, it, it was sort of finished in first fill Oloroso cast. We don't know how long for, but look, judging by the color, like it's an amazing color, pretty long time. But on the nose, oh sorry, I should say this is 51% uh, cask strength. It feels up than the 49. Yeah, 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 but it's only a couple of percentage more. Kind of. What, 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 what are people getting? Stewed raisins, yeah, lots of stewed fruit. Oh yeah, this, this, is, this has been cast in, in first fill Oloroso for a long time. I, I think it's probably started off in uh, Bourbon, but very quickly transferred to Oloroso. I mean, you, you, you look at the color of that. I mean, the, the, the first fill Bourbon would give it those sort of butterscotch vanilla notes and then it's overlaid with as you say with that stewed fruit note so could you pass my water there Matt thanks just sorry I, I always pop a bit of water in and what are people getting uh Yet to get it dry. A slight smoky finish. Yeah. That's interesting, getting because this, this hasn't used any, uh, obviously, no, none of the samples tonight are peated, but it's interesting, people. Guys, if you could. <laughs> interesting, people are sort of saying there's sort of a, a subtle smokiness to it. Now, none of this is using peated malt, but that's interesting on the finish, sort of dry. Um, kind of a sort of a, a charred note, I guess. And so, somebody uh, said there's a hint of smoke on the finish here. But I, I'm getting all those things you'd expect from aged sherry casts, so lots of stewed fruit and figs. And that oily, leathery note. I mean, this and the finish goes on forever. A bit, people are saying a bit, bit chocolatey. But again, what, when, when you think of the of, of the value for money, 145 for a 26 year old, and this is this is a pretty complex. Whiskey, I think. I mean, some people dismiss single grain as being sort of light, and, and it is, of course, lighter than single malt, but aged in really good casks, you know, you get that complexity. Lots of nuttiness, too. Mm. Walnut. What do you think over here, guys? Lovely, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, in interesting comments fr from this side, uh, ladies and gentlemen, that people over here said the comment there was, if he was tasting it blind, he'd never put this as a, as a single grain. It's got lots of lovely complexity. Yeah. But also that, that Gervin spirit is very, as I said, m m that vacuum distillation produces a lighter spirit that, that really reacts quickly with the cast to take on the flavors. Sorry? Uh, as far, I think um, 
La, Ma La Martina case, in which is Stor Straw Law, you know, uh, they, they, the Glenn Turner, they have a multi-pressure still as well. But they, so the 20-year the patent ended in 2012, and that's when La, La Martini Case built that. So, so, so that they have a, 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 a multi-pressure still as well. Hi. I think it's the main thing about this automation process is now because of the energy that they have to think. Yeah. Yeah, I think you see. Yeah. OK. Sorry. Just really saying what Mike said. <laughs> yeah, yes. So, sorry. So that the, the um, we're talking about vacuum distillation there, and um, Mike said that because it's it's energy saving as well as producing a sort of more, a, a more cleaner, elegant type of spirit, you're going to see more and more uh, distilleries uh, look to use multi-pressure stills and vacuum distillation. So, what do we think of this one? Thumbs up. Oh, lots and lots more thumbs up for this one. Any so-so? No. Any thumbs down? No. Okay. Oh, yeah, okay. So, so th this is getting a good uh, thumbs up. Um, I'm not getting any uh, any comments from from the folks back home, but I hope you enjoy it. And we'll move on to Invergordon. Uh, again, this is a special bottling from Master of Malt. And not many of us get to try 45-year-old uh, whiskies. And the value, again, for this, 240 euro, which is, it, you know, is, is, is stunning. And again, that just shows, uh, I think, you know, sometimes, not sometimes, all the time, single malts, pure pot still, get all the hype. And you know, we can very easily forget single grain. But for a 45-year-old, I'm dying to try this. Um, in for Gordon, so I just... <laughs> so in for Gordon was, um, is, is the main source of grain for, it's owned by White and Mackay, goes into the White and Mackay brand, and that started in 1961. Interesting fact of all the active Scottish grain distilleries, as far as I can work out, this is the only one that the base grain is maize. All the others use, uh, use, use wheat. Um, and I, I know, I know for, from my William Grant days, originally um, Girvan used grain and then, then they, they switched, so they used, used uh, maize and they switched to wheat in the uh, 70s just for uh, economics. But anyway, Gordon still uses maize. I think that there's a bit of that, but, but also, it, you, 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 I think you'll find with, with whiskies of, of, of this age, sort of made in the uh, 60s and 70s, they, they have that oiliness to them. So, so some of it's certainly coming from the, the type of grain, the type of still, type of grain, type of still, um, but also, you know, aged whiskies from that time, I think, have this, have this sort of oiliness, almost um, polished mahogany hint on the nose. And, and you, I wouldn't want to say floor polish, but yeah. No, but yeah, I, 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 yeah, I, I mean, Pot polished mahogany in a not in a descriptive sense, not a pejorative sense. So, yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah. So, no, but I mean, as, as you know, it's sort of like you know, menthol is used to describe wine. So, it's, so we we'll keep away from menthol tonight. <laughs> <laughs> So we're getting cream soda, and, and, and certainly this is the, the casks, first filled bourbon, distilled October 1972, bottled July 2018, 44% alcohol. But again, that first filled bourbon, you, yeah, you're getting that cream soda, that lovely, you know, 
v vanilla. Did you say that was bottled in 2017? It was bottled in 2018. And we bought it three weeks ago? Yeah, three weeks ago. It, yeah, it's, it's still on, you can still get, you can still get this in Vergordon and the Gervin at Master and Malt, still in stock. And on, on the back note, I'm, I'm getting a kind of fruit note, I can't put my nose on it, kind of Parma violets. Yeah, sorry, it's a, Pete, yes, yeah. Getting over here, some guy said that there's kind of a, a peach note, maybe a touch of dried apricot. It doesn't taste as old as the it is. It tastes yeah. quite young and spry yeah. and floral. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, yeah, with the peachy, that would link, there's that floral note. So, guys, so people over here saying it, you know, it doesn't taste 45 years, it still has a lot of vibrancy to it. Yeah. First fill bourbon, straight through first fill bourbon. And, and I, th I think that's why you, you're getting that cream soda, that, that big toffee vanilla note fr from, and just, just a little hint of spice. But you're also getting those, those dried fruit notes. I, I think this is a beautiful drought. And like 145 euro for, for a 45 year old. Yeah, kind of that grape skins. Yeah. 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 How would say I'll have a look at So fruity. So we're getting uh, some some comments from the Guys, to, to, to bring the people back home and get getting some, yeah, lots of comments, lots of, you know, excellent emojis, big thumbs up. Gervin's very good. Um, very, so on the 45-year-old uh, comment, very cheap compared to a 45-year-old from Mid Middleton. I hate using cheap for whiskey. Excellent, excellent value for money. But I know what that comment means. And the, yeah, lots of comments on the Invergord and very good. Yeah. Okay, we're rounding it up. Well, first of all, before I talk about the, uh, the totality, what was your favorite of the scotches? What do people think of this? Thumbs up? Yeah. Average? Okay, one average. And thumbs down. Two everyone's thumbs down. Okay, so we're liking the Gervin and the Invergordon. Of the three scotch grain combinations what's the uh, who, whose top is the compass box four four for the compass box five five for, uh, for the Gervin one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve thirty seventeen eighteen nineteen twenty twenty one twenty two for the Gervin and for the Invergordon one two three four five Nine, nine for the Invergordon. So on the evening, I think the, uh, the sherry cask has done the job. So uh, we, we're all lovers of, uh, of big uh, sherry monsters here. So, yeah, I, yes, yeah, as, as Matt said, Irish whiskey drinkers like sherry casks. So, I hope, yes, sorry, come in the back, Aidan. Um, I think that was 150. Sterling. sterling. Sorry, sterling. Yeah. Yes. So. What, what, why? Uh, but, but basically, because people have always, you know, when sort of sing, single malts really only started exporting internationally. Uh, with Glenfiddich in 1963, but before that it was, it was very localised in, in Scotland and they marketed the hell out of it, as did all the single malts. So my, my view is that single malts get all, all the hype because of, you know, 
single provenance, and, and it's been marketed. Single grain, because it goes into blends, and even though blended scotch is 85% of all scotch whiskey, people have a tendency to turn their nose up at a blended scotch and consequently grain as well, single grain as well. My view is that single grain is the quality backbone of, 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 a, of a blend. Yeah, I, I, I think single malts get, get all the hype and consequently uh, single grains are overlooked. So tonight, that, that's why we're, we're focusing on, and I know Alex wanted to focus on single grains for that reason, because you get incredible value for money for the, for the whiskey in the bottle. Yes, mate. That's right, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's, it's Ch Charlie Gordon and, and Sandy Gordon, his brother, went over to the States with samples in a bag and did a massive advertising campaign, which is unheard of at the time. So, yeah, we, we, we've to blame <laughs> Glenn Finnick in 1963 for, for the overprice that you have today. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you've enjoyed that. Um, hope you enjoyed it at home. We'll, we'll link in with some comments uh, after the break. But now we're going to have a quick break. How long? Five, ten minutes. Five, ten minutes. Five, ten minutes. Thanks, everybody.
Now, folks, I hope everyone's, hope everyone's enjoyed those first three whiskies. Um, as, uh, as Kevin was saying, like, grain whiskey is a fantastic whiskey because it can be used as a great base to build upon other flavors like we saw with the sherry, like we saw with the different cask influences. We just looked at Scotch grain whiskies or Scottish grain whiskies. So we had a look at a bit of the history of grain whiskey in Scotland. And as we all know, is Scotland the, his the future? No. No, thank you. Where is the future of whiskey? Ireland. There we go. So we're going to be looking at some very good Irish whiskies now, Irish grain whiskies, and we're going to be starting off with a lovely expression from Teeling and very happy to introduce Robert Caldwell, Global Brand Ambassador for Teeling, here to talk you through their expression. Hercules, Hercules. Oh, are there any questions? If any questions, I'll help you there. Can you see the questions too? I'll see the questions, yeah. All right, perfect. Hi, everybody. Hello. Hi, everybody. How are you getting on? Good, thanks. Well, thanks for having me. Uh, cool. <laughs> you should have brought another bottle. I should have brought another bottle. I apologize. That is my fault, but I, I owe you. Uh, yeah, my name's Rob. I'm the Global Brand Ambassador for Teeling, and it's my pleasure to talk a, bit, a little bit about this particular grain whiskey. Has anyone here had Teeling grain whiskey before? Yeah, of course you have. So you're going to probably sense some similarities. So let's hit the elephant in the room. This is obviously made at GND, owned by John Teeling and, and the lovely guys up there. We're going to taste one of their products at the end. But again, like many things that we do, we want to kind of set it apart. But it's not just being different for different sake. It's easy to say that Teeling have too many whiskies because we have too many whiskies. <laughs> I think it's over 300 at some point. Uh, but they do make sense to us as, especially. You know, the core range is the best representation of each of the styles of Irish whiskey, because for average consumer, they want to kind of narrow it down somewhat. We want to move away from the idea that age statement single malts is the only thing in whiskey. There is grain whiskey and pot still whiskey and blends and, and everything in between. We do peated whiskies. So our core range is that family tree, as it were, or the structure in which we build from. So each of the categories are represented. So we can tie it back. So any limited release or anything like that, this specifically can tie back to, at its core, one of the core releases of Teeling Whiskey, being the Teeling Single Grain that you've probably all had. And the similarities for us, especially with the grain whiskies, has been wine. So as you know, our core single grain is between five and seven years fully matured in Californian Cabernet Sauvignon casks. So a lovely, rich, ripe red fruits of a new world red wine. Fully matured, but a lovely balance of that grain whiskey. In all cases, all three cases that I'm about to talk about, especially the one we're about to try, the composition or the mash bill is the same. 95% grain or 95% corn or maize, 5% malted barley. That 5% is a lovely kind of overarching rough approximation. We're not measuring exactly 5% grain. We're allowing 5% to stay in the mill so we don't have to use artificial enzymes. As we know in Ireland, you can use artificial enzymes to kickstart grain fermentation. We don't have to though. So we add a little bit of malted barley in there to help kickstart that conversion uh, process of sugars into alcohol. And that 5% is just to account for that measure. But primarily, this is a grain dominant mash bill. And then the difference between each of them, like I said, the first fully matured in Californian Cabernet Sauvignon. It's a French oak, uh, comes to us wet, so it's uncharred. So essentially think of it like it's made in, in, in Europe. It's a French oak cask, it's shipped to America. They put their uh, Napa Valley Cabernet Sauvignon in. If you know a little bit about Cabernet Sauvignon in the, uh, in the States, think of brands like Colgan, Ron Bauer, Franks, now again, we don't really kind of talk about it because all of these wine casts comes from our cask broker, but sometimes the cask comes to us stamped. So we can talk a little bit about the particular vineyard, although we shouldn't. Um, so yeah, that was fully matured in red wine. It's got a lovely balance. Uh, what we find from the grain uh, in each of these three different whiskies is vanilla, butterscotch, toffee, caramel, honeycomb. We've mentioned it a couple of times throughout the scotches, but this is far more pronounced from that corn. So this is maize from France. As you can probably tell, we don't really grow corn here in Ireland very well. Uh, same as in Scotland, a little bit more wheat dominated, but France, a little bit warmer climate makes some fantastic non-genetically modified corn. So we grab our corn in uh, and we do get a lot of that vanilla, butterscotch, toffee, caramel, honeycomb sweetness. 
And now that cask influence is about balancing it, really kind of working the sweetness of that particular grape based, a grain based distillate. You know, if you think of like bourbon, they go really far down that category using virgin American oak casks, drawing out vanillins and sweetness. You know, bourbon can be, I guess, somewhat simplified as a sweet style of whiskey. And this whiskey, this grain whiskey, structurally similar to American bourbon. If it were, if it were made in America, you know, it would be legally allowed to be called bourbon. So we're balancing that sweeter style of the grain-based or the corn-based distillate with our wine casks. So the second was Bordeaux red wine. Let's not talk about that too much, but you can see the similarities there side by side with the Napa Valley Cab Sav or New World Cab Sav versus the Old World Cab Sav. This is a further step down the line. So this is a Bordeaux Cabernet Sauvignon casks. So you can start to see where, you know, a little bit of education is being undertaken here because the average consumer just see wine casks. There's a little bit of education around the different styles of red and white wine casks. But having these three separate products allows us to do interesting tastings and, and really kind of flesh that out. So for this one specifically, a lot less tannin, a lot less of those dry kind of fruit notes and uh, the, the deeper, darker kind of rich red fruits that we saw in the first two, and a lot more metallic grapefruit, citrus. So if we jump in here, what we're trying to achieve for this one particularly is a balance, again, of the vanilla, butterscotch, toffee, caramel, honeycomb, sweetness of the corn-based distillate with a little bit more of that white wine quality, that minerality. You know, these words you see in a whiskey tasting, but think of it yourself. Think of these words when you're tasting. We all know our brains can be tricked and, and manipulated in certain ways when you add tasting notes. That's why it's so hard to share your tasting notes when no one's saying anything. You want to sort of start talking and go, yes, that's what it is. I get it now. But we are looking for that minerality, that grapefruit citrus, almost like, so we're not talking sour citrus, like lemon and lime. We're talking that metallic citrus on the way to bitter, like pink grapefruit. That's the kind of sour we're looking for, the kind of bitters quality we're looking for to balance out that sweetness of this particular grain. So 14 years, it was matured in ex-bourbon casks. That wine influence that we're looking for has only been a year. But what we're seeing is each of the ones, so the, the first single grain was between five and seven, fully matured in the uh, red wine from Napa. The second, the 13, I don't know if you guys ever came across that one, don't want to harp on it too long, but 10 years or three years in Bordeaux. And I would argue almost had more red wine influence than the, the regular single grain. And then this one, only a year finished in the white wine. But I still get a profound uh, wine influence on this particular whiskey. Anyone agree? Yeah. yeah. It's also, it's 50% ABV. So we originally went to bottle this at 46, our, you know, our signature ABV, but just that little bit on the lighter side. All of our grains tend to be on the delicate side. We lovingly refer to them as our breakfast whiskies. Um, you know, love to have them in the portfolio, uh, despite, you know, everything that comes with them, where they come from and everything like that. Like it's key, it's as we've been talking about grain whiskey is just an integral part of Irish whiskey as pot still and malt, although it doesn't get the love sometimes and still needs a lot of education in some markets. I got, I got weirdly, my knuckles wrapped weirdly because I pitched in Ohio, I pitched our single grain and I likened it to an Irish bourbon. They're like, oh no, don't say that. I was like, but you're trying to convince people what, or trying to relay what single grain means because Anyone in their right mind would see the word single and grain next to each other and assume, well, this is one type of grain. Mm. And you're trying to say, well, it's almost the exact opposite of that. And it has a lot more structural similarity to American whiskeys. They're like, no. I'm like, okay, all right, all right, fine. But lo and behold, I still pitched the single grain and we still got the listing in, in Ohio, a control state based on the flavors that they respond to in this sweeter style uh, of a corn-based distillate. But yeah, really interesting to see globally the, the education that needs to happen around single grain whiskies. But yeah, going back to this one, anyone have any particular tasting notes they'd like to share? Like a lime cluster. Yeah. Weird, like, I, I don't never have a lime cluster. I, want, I actually, I, I was thinking that there when I was, because I, I can't drink, unfortunately, I got an early flight in the morning, but 
uh, the non-chill filtration adds that creaminess to it. So it's a really fatty whiskey. If you don't believe me, just you know, pour a little bit on your palm of your hand, rub it in, really viscous, kind of creamy, and that can add a certain dairy-like quality to it. So that citrus minerality that we're talking about with that kind of viscous quality that you only kind of see when you're drinking milk or oil, if you're weird, um, <laughs> can have that quality to it. It's not a tart citrus. I, I no. I it's, get much citrus. I, I've got like peaches and cream, that kind of... Yeah, it's... it's lemon curd. I, I, I'm still trying to kind of like find that middle ground. Like I get a lot more, and again, I hate kind of using like... For example, the second whiskey that we tried, I wanted to shout out that Petrichor rubber asphalt quality, because that's what comes to my mind. But I, I think I get bogged down in the negative connotations of those words. But I, I still want to say, it's, it's descriptors, yeah. And the same with this one. So the, I get in lime and lemon a lot of earthy dirt, whereas in uh, grapefruit and the, the lighter kind of styles of citrus, I get more metal, like a metallic kind of quality to it. Again, I just, tend not to say it because it draws those negative connotations yeah. that you, don't, you want to kind of avoid. But that's what I get in this one. Yes, go ahead. Cantaloupe. Cantaloupe. All right, there you go. He wins. Bye. <laughs> that's good. That's good. You know, you're spot on. Yeah. It's got this kind of watery taste. You know, like that particular melon has a very dense flesh to it, you know? Mm. Yeah, that kind of uh, lime green kind of, yeah, yeah. No, it's spot on. It's not exactly citrus. It's more melon. Yeah, that's interesting. I might use that now. I'm going to steal that. Yeah. <laughs> Rob, the, yes. the color is very, it's, it's almost a straw color. Yeah. Having spent time in red wine casks, you know, clearly didn't take so, uh, yeah, uh, forgive me. Yeah, this is white wine. Oh, yeah, this is white wine. Bo yeah, Bordeaux Cabernet Sauvignon. Sauvignon. Sauvignon Blanc, sorry. I knew I was saying something wrong there. I was like, what's not clicking here? Sauvignon Blanc, sorry. Apologies. <laughs> it's why I don't work in the wine industry. Nothing from the chat. They just think you have a nice shirt. Oh, thank you. It's very puzzling. <laughs> Any other tasty notes or questions on, on this one? No? Oh, amazing. That was, that was very good. Cheers, guys. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now, folks, uh, uh, we're about to be passing you over. Sorry, folks. Sorry, folks. Sorry, folks. Sorry, folks. We're about to be passing you over to Mike Clancy, or Michael Clancy. I don't know if he prefers Mike or Michael. I've been calling him Mike all night, so, well, we know which one I prefer. Uh, we'll be tasting a very nice whiskey. Now, the whiskey you can see on the sheet you've got in front of you, and the sheet you've got at home, is not the whiskey we're tasting. We're not tasting the bridge. We're tasting this mysterious bottle. Like I was saying, we're able to get some very nice unreleased whiskeys or special whiskeys for you. And I'll leave it to Mike, or Michael, yeah. to tell you all about the Innie Bay. Perfect. Michael do grand. Um, so um, Rob is heading away there. Um, he's just back at work after getting married recently, <laughs> and he's heading off to Finland in the morning. So you're really lucky to have him. So a big round of applause before he goes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Just say that. We'll see you in Berlin. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So right. Um, Thanks, guys. Thanks for having us. Thanks, thanks to Alex for um, for organising this and, and, and getting us here. I know he's. I think he's he's tuning in from uh, online or whatever. Um, from where? Gibraltar. Gibraltar of all places. Anyway, sure. Great, great. Anyway, listen. Um, so this is actually. So um, Matt was saying uh, what what's on the sheet is the bridge, but this isn't the bridge. It is the bridge. So. It's in the bridge range. So the bridge is a series of whiskies, right? And they're all, it's, it's our basically independent bottler series. So it's, it's our range of source whiskies. And the whole name behind the bridge is, it's a bridge to the point where we have whiskey that we've distilled ourselves in Lanesboro. So each release is, if you like, a step across that bridge, right? So, um, so this is the bridge and it's, it, this will be called the bridge in eBay, okay? Um, 
most of the releases in the bridge series are called after places around Lockery. So Inny Bay is on the uh, on the eastern shore of Lockery. It's where the River Inny runs into Lockery. Um, it's a great spot for there's particularly good spot for trout fishing if you're into trout fishing and and around around that neck of the woods. And it's also kind of on the border. So Lockery is known as it's where the three counties meet. So Longford, Westmead, and Roscommon. So Inny Bay is on the border of Longford and Westmead. Um, so just that's a little bit of the, 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 the background. Um, so yeah, single grain whiskey. And I'll be perfectly honest, we started out in this game and we're at it a number of years. Um, when we started out, we, 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 we bought some mature stock and we, we bought, and everyone, and I'm always saying this, right? But everyone in this industry, there's various stories about what did you buy and what was your sourcing strategy and various things. and we're like pretty much everyone else we 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 bought what we could afford when it became available if it was any good so <laughs> basically um and and that's you know does it, you'll hear lots of other stories and and things but that's the, the basic truth of what pretty much everyone is at so um anyway so when we when we bought this single grain and we bought a reasonable amount of it at the time and we were kind of going what will we do with that? But it's, it, you know, let's buy it anyway. And it's, but it, you know, it's pretty good. It's a good price. Let's buy it, and we'll we'll figure out what to do with it. So we've 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 actually brought out a number of releases in single grain, and they've done very well. And the, the liquid has actually developed very well, and it's taken finishes really well. So we're really really happy with it, and delighted that we had that inspired vision a number of years ago to to actually go down that route. So. Anyway, yeah, just a bit, little bit about single grain and, and to what Kevin was saying earlier. Single grain is, you know, it's a little bit maligned. It's a little bit kind of uh, looked down their nose upon uh, as are blends. And it's funny, you know, there's a, uh, a very well-known whiskey that's known as the pinnacle of Irish whiskey. And a lot of the people who buy it and rush out and buy it every year as a, you know, and, and these people are, aren't necessarily whiskey drinkers, but they buy it because they see it has been... The, the pinnacle of Irish whiskey, they don't even know it's a blend, right? <laughs> um, so in the same way, people kind of look down at, and, and some of those people would probably be horrified if they thought it was a blend, that they were after spending over 200 quid on a bottle of a blend, right? In the same way, and, and some of those same people would look down their noses at, at single grain, but single grain is, is, is a fantastic category, and some of the whiskies we tasted earlier have been fantastic as well. That, that um, particularly that, that Invergordon and the, the, the Gervin, I thought were spectacular whiskies. So anyway, um, it's going to be very interesting to see how Irish single grain develops over the next number of years. So there's obviously, this is Cooley single grain that you're going to taste, but there's also Great Northern single grain coming down the line and starting to come out. But then, then we have kind of the, the, the other ones. We have the Tullamore, we have the, um, the, the, the Royal Oak, the Slain, and uh, you'll see one in, in, in Loch Gill as well, a, a grain plant going in there. So when those plants come online and when we see mature whiskey coming from those, it's going to be really, really interesting. So exciting times ahead as, you know, in, in the whole of Irish whiskey. But that, that's one to watch. And I think it's one where we've kind of, we're not afraid of single grain. In Ireland, uh, by, by and uh, that has happened by necessity rather than by design, but it's, it's happened because that's what has been available. So anyway, enough about that, about that. So this is yeah. So this is and uh, so some of you will have followed our single grain. Some of you will have, have had our Bethlehem release, and um, some of you will have had our Killinure and Lacaro releases last year. So these are all I, I like kind of talk 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 about them as sisters, right? So they're sisters of each other. They're basically the same liquid started off. If, if some of you were at our tasting last year in Churchtown, um, you know where we tasted three single grains side by side, they were all the same liquid starting off, and they had different finishes for different lengths of, lengths of time. This is another from the same same batch essentially. And this has had another, essentially another year of finishing on it. So we have two of these single grains coming out this year, um, and they're, they're literally ready to bottle. I have the labels, and they'll be bottled as soon as our distiller comes back from holidays in a couple of weeks' time. Um, but basically, um, the other one that's coming out is a, is a, is a, 
an oloroso cask. Uh, so it basically got uh, nine years, two months in bourbon and three years, 10 months in, in an oloroso cask. So uh, I chose this one for the tasting rather than the oloroso one because it's a bit quirky, right? And I've had this at a few different tastings and events and stuff over the summer and I've kind of, people kind of go, oh yeah, I want to taste the sherry one. And I said, no, here, taste this one first and then taste the sherry one. So this one is a little unusual, it's a little quirky, and that's why I said, yeah, let's, let's throw it up here. So, right, um, so this one, right, it's, it's, this got, this was in a bourbon cask uh, for nine years, two months, and then it was in a Samontano red wine cask for 15 and a half months, okay? So Samontano, I'll, go, I'll, I'll kind of go back around and tell you what Samontano is. So Samontano is over the wall from Rioja, okay? So when I was looking for casks at the time, I, was, I, I had bought this whiskey and I was looking at different casks. And again, it's, this is by accident rather than by design. And I'll be perfectly honest with you, right? So I was looking for Rioja casks at the time. And the, the broker that I was, I was buying the casks from hadn't, hadn't any Rioja casks. And they said, you should try this one. We have some Montano casks. Take a punt on it. It's really good. The wine is really good. So, one of the cast brokers we, we deal with, um, and there's, there's lots of cast brokers out there, and some of them are complete fly-by-nights and charlatans and uh, gangsters, right? Um, but basically, th these, these guys that we deal with, they actually, before the cast comes back, they actually take a sample of the wine, they, they scientifically test the wine, analyze it, make sure the wine is okay, then they take the casks in, then they check the casks, make sure the casks are okay, um, so you're, 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 and they do the standard kind of pressure test the casks and all of that. So basically you're sure that you're getting a really good cask, that it has had really good wine, that there's no faults, there's no sulfur, there's no issues with the cask. So anything that I've brought from them, I've been really, really happy with. So anyway, so, so Montano, um, this is from a, a producer called El Grillo y la Luna, right? So these guys are in Barbastro, I'd probably, if I had a few more, I'd probably bastardize that even more. But anyway, they're in the, it's in the foothills of the Pyrenees in northern Spain, okay? Um, and the grapes used for this wine would be Syrah and, Syrah and Cabernet Sauvignon, okay? So El Grillo y la Luna is the cricket on the moon, okay? So their family producer, I actually, at Pro Wine in Dusseldorf last year, I met the producers, I tasted the wine. The wine kind of bears out the effect that it's had on the cask, which is really cool. So anyway, I'll, 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 I'll go on to, to kind of talk about the whiskey. So why this one is, is, is kind of unusual. The first thing is just, just have a little look at it first if, you've, if you haven't sculled it yet <laughs> while I've been <laughs> yammering on. Um, so there's a little hint of pink to this, right? Um, and there's probably a little less than there was, you know, a couple of years ago, it was quite pronounced. And, and sometimes that happens with with wine casts, they can be quite pink to start and then it tones down after a while. But there still is a, a little hint of pink into this, so which, is, which is quite nice. So um, basically what, what, what intrigues me about this, right, is you'll get this kind of red fruit on the nose, okay? So, um, strawberries, 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 absolutely, 100%, right? And, and I was thinking today, and I, I, I retasted this earlier, right, this morning when I had a kind of fresh palate and all that sort of stuff, right? Breakfast. 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 <laughs> yeah. So what this, what this brings, and, and to me, right, I, I'm always kind of being brought back to, I, I, I smell something or I taste something and I'm kind of going, what does that bring me back? I, I, I know that taste or I know that smell from somewhere, right? So in my previous career, before I got into this, I worked as an engineering consultant and we did a lot of work for breweries and distilleries, but I also did energy audits. And one of the energy audits we did were, was in a cereal factory, right, for Kellogg's in Spain, okay? And this brings me back to the place where they make the special K with red berries, okay? <laughs> and I just, I, it's uncanny, the smell stayed with me, like, it's, because, because it was, it was, it was, it was, it, the, where, they, where they did this, the place was like, co you went into this, it was like a mill and, you went into this room and it was just covered in red dust. And if you stayed in there for long, you'd come out with, with like bright red hair, you know. But it was, it was um, a particular sm really strong smell that's really intense and stays with you. So anyway, and I looked that up today. Special K red berry has strawberries and cherries in it, right? So anyway, that's what I get on the nose of this. Um, 
there's also um, there's also vanilla in there as well, which again comes from your 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 um, your, your bourbon casks. Um, so have a little taste in. And even get the mint. <laughs> <laughs> joke, joke. <laughs> Right. I get the red fruit notes more on the palate than the nose than the yeah. nose, but I got like dried orange for some reason. Okay, yeah, yeah, well that's, yeah, that's in, well, that, that would be, the, that's the bourbon and uh, that's, uh, that's the grain, kind of the fruity grain influence. Um, so yeah, so what do you, what do you pick up on this, guys? I'm not going to, uh, tell me, tell me what you get over here. Christmas mandarin. It's hot strawberry sauce that goes into Christmas mandarins. Okay. And nice. Brilliant. Thank you. A question to ask you. Something you said. Do you import the casks fully prepared just to fill it in? You don't want to have coopers. We don't have coopers. So we're not. We're currently in a temporary premises. We're not in. So basically, this stuff is all sourced. This this whiskey and. Um, we're currently using a third party bond. Um, so the, the casks that we buy in, basically we're, we're, we're buying them in fit to fill, essentially. Um, and that's why I'm, I'm very ca careful about where I would buy any casks from. I've, I've spent a lot of time on that um, and, and dealing with different Coopers and looking at different Coopers and uh, being, being just very careful about how long between when you see the cask or buy the cask and you get it and put liquid in it? So literally as soon as we can get get it in and get the cask in, get get it shipped, get the cask, get the liquid into the cask. Um, you know, particularly if if it's had wine or if it, or if and we've done a number of beer finishes as well. If you've had wine or if you've had beer in a cask, you need to get spirit into it as soon as you can. That's that's essentially the, the story. If it's had spirit in it before, it's grand for a while, but um, if it's if it's had wine or beer, you need to fill it quickly. So what else are we tasting over there? It's really creamy. Um, yeah. creamy and I can I can taste the relationship to say Bethlehem, which I'm a big huge fan of. Yeah. There's, there's, a, there's a similarity in the architecture of it in the way. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, I hear you on that. That's the, and that's the grain kind of family. Gentlemen down the end, uh, Jack and Eddie, what are you tasting? It's a lovely whiskey, honestly. It's nice. <laughs> 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 it's nice, isn't it? It's, 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 it's delicate, but it's... Yeah. Yeah. No. 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 The wine casts. Uh, if you get the right wine casts, they can be fantastic. And that. That. I'm uh, really happy with that. Mike, I said to you, as I said to Peter as well, your finishing is incredible. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, like I've never. All the stuff that you're doing on the brew series, I haven't had that one yet. Yeah. Well, thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Appreciate that. So. And, and, and with that, right, so I'm going to say the other, what we did with this cask, right, so this was, because it was a red wine cask, it was, and, and it, because it was Sumantano, it's known for, and, and Rob used this word earlier, he used this word, minerality, which is this kind of dry, like, and I saw a description, I was kind of looking up, what's the description of minerality, and someone said, like, licking a stone. <laughs> and, you know, it, it's hard, it's one of these things, it's, it's just, it's minerality, it's like, you know, but um, anyway, it, it, it's, um, it's got this kind of dryness to it, and it was quite dry when we tasted it, so we actually moved it back into a bourbon cask, so we moved it back into a first fill bourbon cask, which kind of sweetened it up, sweetened up the back end of it, and has, has brought that sweetness back into it, so it, it was, so that, and, and I think, you know, you have to kind of, Look at stuff and not be afraid to move stuff, but but at the, but the converse of that is don't be chopping and changing stuff all the time. Give it time. And and I was at something recently and somebody was talking about casks and it was like, time is a great healer, you know. And um, time in the right cask is a great healer. But um, th it, this wasn't it, it wasn't faulty in the wine cask. It was just a little bit dry and it just needed to be sweetened up. So we moved it into bourbon and it's kind of picked up nice sweetness 
but um, it, it's, I, I really like this. I could sit down quite comfortably and have three or four glasses of this and it's, it's just so pleasant. It's, 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 it's 13 years old, right? It's, um, it's fruity, it's still quite delicate um, and it's just unusual, it's different. And I, I'm gonna finish up on it, like our, our kind of, um, almost, I, I nearly think of it as our responsibility with this kind of range as kind of independent bottlers is to do different things, right? So we could all, so Bethlehem was a, was a PX cask. It was a really old PX cask. It was a beautiful, fantastic cask. We could buy like decent whiskey, put it in, you know, we could buy decent single malt, put it in PX casks, it'd be lovely. And we could do that all day long, but everyone else is doing that, right? So with this range, it's about doing different things. So we'll do the PX casks, we'll do the Olorosa casks, but we also want to do different things outside of that. And this is one of those. We, did, we also did, a, like in, in the bridge range, we also did a 14-year-old single malt finished in a Montbaziliac wine cask, which was quite, it was a little divisive, right? It was quite dry as a whiskey. So people who didn't like white wine didn't really like it. But for people who appreciated the dryness, they really liked it, you know? So, and like when you see people walking in our door in Lanesboro and walking in and buying three or four bottles at 120 quid a pop, they like it, <laughs> you know? So, it's, it's that, so that's the way. So anyway, that's, I'm gonna finish up on that, but uh, yeah, thanks guys. Yeah. So this is, there's about, there's, there's about uh, 300 and, I think about 307, 308 bottles of this. It'll be out about the middle of October. Um, so if you're not on our Lockery Distillery mailing list, get on it and you can buy it, but it will also be available in Celtic as well. So, so this one is called Inny Bay. There's also another one coming out, single grain coming out at the same time called Gailey Bay. So Inny Bay is on the, on the, the, the Longford shore, the eastern shore of Lockery. Gailey Bay is almost directly opposite on the uh, western shore. Um, and, and Gailey Bay is an Oloroso cast finish for uh, since October 2019. So it's it's classic kind of sherry cast finish. Anyway, thanks guys. Another round of applause, sure, why not? That was a good whiskey, wasn't it? Um, I'll pass this around so you can get the name. So it's Inny Bay, I-N-N-Y, Bay. You should know how to spell the word Bay. <laughs> so, <laughs> folks, we've had some very nice whiskies. We've had some very old whiskies. We're about to move on to a very young whiskey that some of you may have had, at the very least, some components of. But before we hop onto that, I'm just going to really quick mention, for those of you at home, at the end of this, I am going to be asking you for your top three whiskies you've had, whether that's four, five, six, five, six, four, it's definitely not any of the scotches in your top three. So just get ready. I will be asking you to put that into the chat and the folks here in the room will be asking you obviously the same. And for those of you who maybe during the break horsed into your spotlight sample, again, we are looking for tasting notes. We're looking for little feedback, bits and pieces, so we can share that with the company, with the distilleries. And then they, of course, give us maybe some more whiskies in the future, which we can give to you. Great. So we're going to be moving on to Great Northern Distillery, seven-year-old whiskey. It is the youngest whiskey on this tasting, but we decided to kind of finish on this because it is actually surprisingly, you might say, very tasty. Because grain whiskey, like I said earlier, it can be a very good base to take on very good flavors. It can be very good kind of custardy, creamy, vanilla-y, but also bring on some other flavors. And this has been finished in a NCOB, newly charred oak barrel. It is a seven-year-old whiskey, and it spent the last... 14 months in a newly charred oak barrel. So it is a very nice single grain whiskey. Fin started, of course, like in ex bourbon barrels and has taken on a lot of those vanilla, butterscotch notes you'll expect, but also some of those gingery spice notes that you're gonna get from the, uh, from the newly charred oak barrel coming through. Again, Alex did a very good job of contacting uh, Great Northern Distillery and they sent us barrels here they sent us this this was disgorged specially for us it is a trade sample not for resale so unfortunately this last little bit will have to be shared or spared around for the society members 
it is 62.77% ABV. It is cast strength, another reason why we finished off tonight on it. Interestingly, when we were kind of, well, when we, when Alex was doing the running for this tasting, it was at 63.3% ABV. So in the two-ish or three-ish months between that, it went down to 62.77, showing the influence that new cask can have on soaking up that alcohol, having the bit of evaporation where the alcohol can go down a significant amount, but obviously 62.77 is quite strong. They would recommend drinking this at 46%. The tasting notes they provided, which I'm going to look into in a moment, do recommend drinking it at 46%. So if you're not a fan of cast strength, or maybe you just want to give it a sip of cast strength and then bring it down to 46, that is the recommended way of drinking this. So I'm going to go in. I'm going to have a nose. This is the first time I'm nosing it as well. It's quite hot. It's quite hot. Massive, yeah, the, um, the tasting notes for this whiskey say that it will start off with vanilla, that will have some toffee, and then it will lean into that char, the oak spice, that newly charred oak barrel, 14 months in there. We have a question for Michael. Just weird, sorry. Um, is, is that, new, is that uh, an SPR cask, uh, like a, a rechar cask, with X wine cask, or is it a... A virgin oak, I believe. Virgin oak, newly charred, so a single, yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Y
ship their whiskey to GND, their, their grain, sorry, to GND to get contract distilled, but a lot of distilleries will just buy whatever's coming off the stills on that day. We have from the ch we have from it was an ex bourbon and then into newly charred oak barrel. Yeah, so we have from the chat people saying it's fantastic. You would not believe that it's a seven year old. We have as well. You know, it's warming without burning, and that's I think fair. Even at cask strength, it's it's hot. You can definitely feel the alcohol. It kind of sucks the the kind of moisture out of your cheeks, like a very kind of strong bold wine will. But it doesn't burn you. At least not for people who are used to cask strength. Any idea of cost? Of cost? It's, it's G&D. If you're willing to buy, um, I mean, 100 barrels, of it, they'll sell it to you. I do not think they are going to be selling single barrels. It's only for the trade sample. It's only for the fact that we are society members. We give the feedback. We let them know we like their stuff, that they will do this for us. So they disgorge this cask, especially for us. The only thing we had to do was pay for the tax on it because, obviously, they didn't want to... Yeah, and, and the bottling, obviously, yeah. They, so it was, it was very nice of them to do this for us. So maybe, again, if you're on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, all those lovely social media sites that do harvest your data, maybe just give a little quick shout-out to G&D for some fantastic whiskey that they can sell, and they might consider selling on their own right, under their own label. It could be a good idea. Any other thoughts in the room on this before we maybe head towards wrapping up and looking at what our favourites were? No thoughts? Yeah. Exactly. From here in the room, we have people saying it's quite botanical that you might get from a gin, but that it's obviously from a whiskey, you wouldn't be expecting botanical notes, but from that fresh cask, you do sometimes get that uh, kind of herbal note, the oak, earthy notes coming through. What happens to this if it goes another 20 years in the barrel? G&D hasn't been around that long. I mean, we're going to see what they do. I mean, that's a seven-year-old. That's a seven-year-old. Yeah. Or, like, if it'll get better. Yeah. I don't think so. I think in 20 years' time, it's just going to go, you know what? Will it, yeah, retail? No, they won't. Um, yeah. So, folks in the chat, I'm going to ask you guys here, in the chat, give me your top three. If you want to give me your top six, give me your top six, but I'm going to go through the room, ask kind of, you know, favorite whiskeys here, what the best whiskey of the evening was, and then I'll go to the chat so you guys can have your say too. I'm going to start off with the start. Whiskey number one, the uh, Compass Box Hedonism Squared. Favorites? One, two, three. Three. A favorites? Uh, no, not a favorite. We have three for that. Next up was the Gervin, that big beast of the sherry whiskey. What do we think? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight. Next up, the Invergordon, the 45-year-old Scotch. Does age matter? Is it just a number? <laughs> One, two, three, four, five. We have five for that. Next up, moving on to the Irish whiskey, the <coughs> better whiskies, obviously. <laughs> We've got the Teeling. The white wine cask finish. We've got one and two and three and four. Do we have five? Do we only have five? Going five? No, we do not. Oh, no. So that lovely whiskey from Teeling. Loch Ree, the Innie Bay. Firm favorite in the room. And I think I see some hands that have gone up twice now, but sure, we'll, <laughs> we'll count just twice. You've got two hands. We're one and two and three and four and five and six and seven and eight and nine and 10 and 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. It is the out and out in the room winner. Dare I ask? <laughs> Dare I ask? One and two and three and four. A close second. Folks, in the... Uh, we have unfortunately, uh, we had, someone had a mint tasted uh, lockery so they couldn't judge. G&D waiting for non-minted. Lockery, teeling G&D, tied second, Gurren, very good. We have a question, how about the society getting a bottle of G&D? The society getting a, sorry, not a bottle, a cask of G&D. I think we have one. Yeah, I, I, I won't leave the chat, but I think if you check our website, we have casks. We might have a, it might not be single grain. It's not single grain, but yes, yeah. G&D, G&D, three, five, 
three five six two, so three in for Gordon. Yes. Okay. So, uh, folks, we're going to leave the chat. Folks, we're going to leave the chat open so you guys at home can, of course, chat to each other, let you know what the favourite is, or you can leave, you can drink your whiskies in peace to yourselves. We're going to wrap things up. Once again, a big chat, big thank you to Alex. Unfortunately, can't be here for organising a fantastic evening and for sourcing. <laughs> and I'm going to hand you over to the society president. Have a quick little round of Thanks very much. Thanks, folks. Um, just, just wanted to wrap up and uh, to thank our, our two presenters uh, who were leading the, uh, the, uh, the tasting this evening. We had Matt and we had Kevin. Round of applause for them. And, and particularly then for, for the guests that we had this evening, we had uh, uh, Rob Caldwell from, uh, from Teeling. and Mike Clancy from Lockery. So thanks very much indeed. I hope you enjoyed the evening. We certainly enjoyed it here and we look forward to, uh, to further tastings both in person and online. And until then, Iwagi, thanks very much. Good night.